Oftentimes, we as members of the Lord's Church are questioned around this holiday season as to why we choose not to celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus or any kind of religious holiday. There are various reasons that can be given for that, and I'm not going to have the time to discuss them in depth or in any detail this evening. So I would encourage you to go on over, you're on YouTube anyway, and search for the truth about Christmas. Brother Don Blackwell does an outstanding job, and of course he was sponsored in doing that by the World Video Bible School, but he does an outstanding job in a complete discussion of this that, by the way, is only going to take about 35 minutes of your time, and I do encourage you to watch that. Now with that being said, I assume that you're like so many who would jump to the conclusion or make the assumption that because the birth of Jesus was such a great event that the Bible must say much about it. But that's simply not the case. The books that discuss the life of Jesus are the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of those four books, you have to understand that very little even is said about the birth of Jesus. For example, in the book of Matthew, which by the way contains 1,071 verses, only 23 verses are selected to give a discussion at all containing the Jesus' birth. You move on to the book of Mark, and you have to consider out of the 678 verses in the book of Mark, there is absolutely no mention of his birth, although we know that he was born. The book of Luke, being next in that, out of 1,151 verses, makes mention of only 20 verses that discuss the birth of Jesus at all. The book of John is much like the book of Mark. Out of 879 verses, there is no mention of Jesus' birth whatsoever. And then concluding there, to consider all of that in light of the truth, we have to understand only 55 of the 3,779 verses in the gospel accounts have anything at all to do with the birth of Jesus. Friends, that's 1.4%. That tells me that 98.6% of the New Testament discusses something other than, or rather than, the birth of Jesus. Now, is that to say that we should not be aware of it? Certainly not. Obviously, I would give the argument that if Jesus was born, that he had to be born in order to live. He had to live in order to die. And so the birth of Jesus is significant from that perspective. Now, with that being the case, that is, that the birth of Jesus is rarely even mentioned in Scripture, that doesn't give us the authority, however, based upon that to simply discredit it. There are certain things that are taught in Scripture that if they're taught in only one verse and only one passage of the New Testament under which you and I live, that we're commanded yet to do. So that's not really much of an argument, is it? But it does show us that God did not seemingly put as much focus on it as we would have concerning his death later on in those same books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I would also bring this to your attention, as you would well know it. The Bible in no wise and in no place ever gives us a command or even the authority, if you will, to celebrate Christmas or any other religious holiday or to commemorate or remember anything save his death. As a matter of fact, Matthew chapter 26, the whole context there really should be read, but especially verses 26 and following, Jesus there instituted by example what we know as the Lord's Supper. And therefore he did that so that we could remember his broken body, remember the shed blood that would be found later on that next day or so on the cross. We also understand the Apostle Paul in recounting that to us. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 and 25 tells us that we're commanded to do that even today, as Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. We know according to Acts chapter 20, and verse 7, the disciples, that is the apostles, that they did continue on. They did institute that. They did celebrate the death of Jesus on that point in time on a weekly basis. And that's what we do. That's why we as members of the church partake of the Lord's Supper. We're doing it to remember or to commemorate his death and not his birth. Now, with that being said, I want to discuss with you the idea this evening then that we ought to allow Jesus to go beyond the manger. Friends, if we leave Jesus in that manger scene as we like to think of it, we have to understand and realize that leaving him there is to leave us without salvation. To leave Jesus in the manger and to celebrate that is such a big day in in his life and and even in ours if we make it that, is to leave ourselves without hope. There are three things I want to discuss with you and we'll subhead some of these, but that is that we ought to allow, number one, Jesus to go beyond the manger because of his power. What do I mean by that? Friends, as you can illustrate with any child and you consider him in the manger, that little baby Jesus was helpless. Everything that had to be done from feedings to diaper changes to moving him from one place to another to understanding what he needed because he could not speak, those things could not be done by Jesus alone. They had to be done by his parents. 
But friends, if we'll allow Jesus to go beyond the manger, to go ahead and become the young boy that is recorded at age 12 in there in the temples, learning at the feet of the others and also teaching them, if we'll allow him to grow into the man that he would become as recorded in his earthly ministry roughly from ages 30 to 33, then we see a young infant who goes from being helpless to being all-powerful. As a matter of fact, he tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, he says, all power, that is authority, has been given to me in heaven and in earth. You see, Jesus there says, all the power that God has ever embodied as a deity, a being, is being given to me. Now, friends, if we leave in the manger, he had none of that. I want you to consider it like this. Jesus' power was not seen until his will was set forth. For example, in Matthew chapter 4, we find Jesus there in a discussion, if you will, being tempted by the devil. And time and time again, Jesus imposed the will of God on him when he quoted scripture. As a matter of fact, Matthew 4 and verse 4, Jesus quoted to the devil and said this, that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You see, Jesus was allowing God's will to be done. Prior to that, and in the manger, because he could not speak, he could have never expressed to us the will of God. You also consider his words. In John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus tells us that the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last days. Again, without those words, as an infant, which he had none of those words, could you and I be judged by anything at all? Certainly not. So you consider his will, you consider his words, but you ought to also consider his works. Let me ask you something. The book of John records basically about seven miracles that Jesus would perform throughout the course of his life. And we obviously realize he performed many more than that. But there are seven particular miracles recorded throughout the book of John. And I want to ask you at the end of each of these, and we're only going into brief discussion, could Jesus have done this in the manger? Could he express his power through his works in the manger, such as what we find in the book of John? For example, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, we find out Jesus was able by that point in time as an adult to change water to wine, hence representing the ability of God to create something out of something else. Could Jesus do that as a baby? Absolutely not. We move forward in John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. And we learn there that Jesus was able to heal the nobleman's son. To take a young boy, a lad, who at that point in time was going to lose his life, but because of the power and the works of our Lord, God, Jesus, he was healed from that devastating disorder. We also understand in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 17, basically the same thing. There was a man there by the pool of Bethesda who believed if he could only enter in the water during the troubling of the waters, he could be healed from his lameness. But yet Jesus comes by. Jesus doesn't have to roll him in the water. He doesn't have to go with this fictitious idea and thought that they had. Jesus healed the man on the spot and said, take up thy bed and walk. Which is reported to us in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, not as a baby, not as an infant, but as a man, he walked on water. Friends, we understand how amazing that is. What an unbelievable feat that that would have been to see and to witness. And I wonder how many times, how many lives would have been changed if we could see that physically today. Probably no more than with those who see it spiritually through God's word, I'm sure. We understand also a little bit later in the book, John chapter 6, verses 15 through 21, Jesus feeds 5,000 men alone, probably most likely upwards of 20, 25,000 people, individuals concerning wives and children, ate that day by the miracle of God, not the one performed by an infant, but yet one performed by a man. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41, we find there a lengthy discussion of how Jesus healed a blind man, one that was born blind, blind from birth, but yet Jesus healed him. We also find in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45, Jesus was able to raise Lazarus from the dead, a man who had been dead four days, one of which the Bible said he stinketh at this point. But yet Jesus said only a few words, and that was Lazarus come forth, and that's exactly what he did. He was alive again. Now I want to ask you again concerning that. Did Jesus have that power in the manger? Was he helpless in the manger or did he have the power? Well, the answer is obvious. He had no power in the manger not to do any of those things, not concerning his will, not concerning his word, and certainly not concerning his works. But yet this man will become all powerful as he would grow up. Now, likewise, I also beg of you to consider his power, but also consider his position. What I mean by that is in the manger, Jesus was loved, wasn't he? Just as any other infant would be, at least by people who are typical or average or normal in this life, why any adult typically who sees a young baby, an infant, what do they want to do? They're attracted to it. 
It doesn't matter the character that that person would become, the soul that's inside and what it would turn into one day, how sinful or evil it could potentially become. We also love babies. We love to see infants. We love them. But is that the case about Jesus later in life? Certainly not. Jesus went from the most beloved baby in the manger to one of the most hated men who would ever walk upon the face of the earth. Now, when you consider that, you ought to consider the reality of it. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13, we find out that Herod would seek to slay Jesus. Now, certainly that's why Jesus was still young, perhaps and most likely less than a year or two or three years old. Herod is trying to slay Jesus, that same baby who in a manger was loved, ultimately would become hated. That's a change in the position. But not only the reality of it, we have to understand the relation of it. In John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, Jesus told his disciples during that discussion, you will be hated just like I am. Just in the same way that I am hated, you likewise will be hated. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, Jesus told his disciples there, you should be hated of all men for my name's sake, but yet he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And so we have to understand Jesus, yes, he changed his position in life. When he left the manger, and that's what we ought to allow him to do, go beyond the manger, he went from that loved or beloved baby to that hated man. And there's a reason for that. In John chapter 3 and verse 19, we learn that Jesus told his disciples there that men would love darkness rather than light. Friends, the light that Jesus exuded, the light that he expressed, the light that he gave by his good example in life, by his perfect life, is that which is hated among the evil of this world. And friends, it's the truth that Jesus Christ had to go beyond the manger to get to that point. Friends, if he had not been hated, he would have not been slain. Had he not been slain, he would not have been able to rise from the dead. Had he not risen from the dead, he would not have ascended on high. And all of that being said, he would not have saved one soul from the sin of this life. All of us again will be hopeless if it had not been for the change of his position and power. Now, thirdly and finally, I believe it is the case we ought to allow Jesus to go beyond the manger, not only because of his power and his position, but even because of his petition. What I mean by that, friends, you understand as well as I do, in the manger, Jesus made no binding demands of us in that manger scene. Now, certainly he demanded in a way through his cries, he demanded that his mother change his diaper. He demanded of his mother that he be fed and he be cared for. And certainly through her moral and motherly obligations, she certainly did that. But he made no demands in that manger that are binding upon anyone save his parents. But as a man, he certainly did. As a man, Jesus made demands upon us that are not only binding them some 2,000 some odd years ago, but remain binding today and will bind themselves all the way until eternity should turn, until his judgments had come. For example, concerning the petitions that he expressed, he petitioned us concerning our situation. As recorded in John chapter 8 and verse 11, we find there a scene where Jesus has brought a woman who's been caught in the very act of adultery. Now, under Old Testament law, under which they lived then, the law of Moses, this lady being guilty of adultery should have been stoned to death. It's absolutely the case that she could have been stoned to death under the law of Moses. Legally and binding, that could have been set forth. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus began to question the men who brought her over and asked them, who among you is so perfect, if you will, I'm paraphrasing, but who among you is so sinless that you can cast the first stone? Now, if you remember the account, all of those men left. Every one of them, one by one, as he wrote there on the ground something that we do not know or even understand, Every one of those men left. Now, what did Jesus tell the woman? Did he tell her to go and to do whatever she wanted to do, to live however she wanted to live, continue in the act of adultery or what have you? No. Jesus commanded upon her through petition, woman, go and sin no more. Now, could a baby do that? Could Jesus and did Jesus in the manger do such things as that? No, absolutely not. But not only concerning our, if you will, situation, but likewise concerning, and this is most important, please don't lose me here concerning our salvation. His petitions concerning our salvation are the most important consideration that you and I must have today. For example, we learn out of the very mouth, out of the very words of our Lord concerning our salvation, what he desires in order that we might be saved. Now someone says, oh, this is hard to discern. This is hard to understand. Uh, you've got to piece things together to come up with a plan, if you will, of salvation. And that's true. But friends, all of these things are supported out of the very mouth of our Lord. For example, in John chapter 8 and verse 24, Jesus said, Except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. What's meant by that? Jesus said, you better believe that I'm God. 
You better believe that I am the I am. That is the I am which has no beginning and no ending. I'm as much God as a God in the Son as God the Father is in, in the heavens. Jesus demanded that upon us. That was a petition. Likewise, it was out of the very mouth of Jesus. Not only did he demand upon us to believe, but he also demanded upon us, if you will, that we ought to repent. In Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, Jesus said these words. He said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Friends, to perish is the opposite of being saved. To perish is the opposite of salvation. So Jesus, through his petition, in light of our salvation, he urged us, he commanded upon us also to repent. Likewise, it was our Lord Jesus, who is recorded in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, also petitioned us to confess. He said, if you're willing, and I'm paraphrasing again, but look it up, check me out. He said, if you're willing to confess me before men, that is mankind, it'll be you, the same person, you, who I'll confess before my father. That is, I'll stand before my father and say, I know who this man is. I understand his or her life, and they've lived the life that we required, Father. But he also turns that on its head in the very next verse, verse 33, and says, however, if you're willing to deny me or you're desirous to deny me before men, it'll be you, the same man, who I'll deny before the Father. Friends, how sad of a case could that be? To stand before the throne of judgment and to have our Lord himself deny us as to say, I never knew the man. I never knew who, or who he or she was. What a sad case that is. But not only did he petition us in light of our salvation to hear, to believe, to repent, he petitioned us to, to confess, but he also petitioned us to be baptized. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, he tells us very easily and very quickly, he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, friends, that word and is a coordinating conjunction which says whatever is said on the one side of it and the other side are just as important. He said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Now, some will argue, well, he didn't say you'd be condemned for not being baptized. Oh, friends, what he understood is this. You'll never be baptized unless you believe. Unless you can rely on and lean on the fact that I'm God in the body. I'm as much deity as God ever was and will be. Unless you understand that, you'll never do my will. And it would be Jesus in the last place. As we mentioned a few moments ago from Matthew 10 and verse 22, he would say, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Watch this. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. What do you mean by that, Jesus? What he meant was this. It's very simple. He meant you're going to have to remain faithful. Not only believe, not only repent, not only confess, not only be baptized, but also to remain faithful. That's what Jesus required of us. So friends, I want to urge you one more time, please. I understand the, if you will, the, the uh, sensitivity of such a subject. This I understand that there are many who are going to have cantatas and plays and, and commemorations and remembrances of the birth of Jesus. But I beg of you, number one, the Bible in no wise tells us to celebrate that. The Bible in no wise commands us or even gives us the authority, truthfully, to commemorate him in that way. It does, however, urge us to commemorate his death, as we ought to do on every first day of the week. But even in addition to that, friends, I beg of you, please, let Jesus out of the manger. Friends, this has been a discussion on why I would and why many members of the church ought to and choose not to celebrate Christmas as a religious holiday. I thank you so much of your time, and I pray that you'll consider these things in light of God's word.